thank you so much for the warm welcome uh good morning good evening good afternoon uh wherever you guys are joining in from and um uh, so excited to be a part of the uh, hello alny uh, celebration for the 10th global accessibility awareness day um i can see that there's a wonderful lineup and um, i'm i'd like to thank the organizers for inviting um us from ola mobility institute over here to give a presentation uh i'm going to apologize uh uh right out uh, at the outset uh, we i have a poor network over here and uh, so i'll i'll be keeping my camera off but i assure you you're not missing anything um uh, so uh, uh just kind of in a bear with me for a while <clears throat> so um i'll be speaking about urban transport accessibility uh this is a topic very close to my heart um and um um tanisha has already mentioned uh, i'd just like to make a small correction i work with the ola mobility institute and uh, for those of you who uh, don't know about the institute we are a think tank uh, which works at the intersection of uh, mobility innovation and public good um we include uh, we, we focus on areas like accessibility and inclusion we also do work around urban mobility electric mobility energy future of work uh platform economy and so on and so forth i had uh, accessibility and inclusion at the institute um while we are uh, funded by ola we uh, maintain uh, an independent operation and what that means is uh, we we really don't influence business operations um business decision strategic uh, decisions or customer uh, kind of you know service um aspects of the uh, of ola operation so unfortunately kind of you know uh, if if you have any feedback on that count i'll be happy to pass it on but i might not be the right person to action on that um so with that uh, uh let's start uh sanjay maybe next slide so uh, you know most of you would be aware that uh, we have a large population of persons with disability and um there are multiple sources and multiple figures right from census 2020 Eleven, which um, which quotes a figure of two point twenty six point eight million, and uh, you know you have global disability rates of fifteen uh, percent, which when applied uh, gives a figure of roughly one eighty million, and uh, may maybe the number of persons with disability is somewhere near that. Uh, the the latest conservative estimates that comes from non government sources um, uh, is around hundred million, and uh, 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 in most like in all likelihood this is an under representation. um in 2016 as you all would have would know india passed um, rights of persons with disabilities act and we recognize 21 disabilities under that which is an increment from the earlier act of, from 1995 which recognized seven disabilities that's the act which uh, was referred to when the census was done so uh, in all likelihood the number of uh, persons with disability uh, in the next census would be uh, much higher and but the important fact is it's it's a large uh, population and uh, it's about 10% of our our kind of you know um, citizens over here and so <clears throat> the needs of persons with disabilities are certainly important next slide so um, you know just like any non disabled person persons with disability also uh, require safe accessible reliable and affordable means of transportation transportation is really a catalyst it it uh, enables access to variety of operation uh, opportunities right from social and cultural uh, you know uh, seeing a family member or going out with friends for dinner um, i know something that we all would be missing uh, given the times that we are living in right now to um, educational opportunities really interacting at a school with uh, other peers uh, employment healthcare and what have you um, it's really it, um, a tool which is helping to unlock the full value of human potential and um uh, we've already seen how lack of physical interaction how uh, breakdown of transportation is really destructive to economy but also destructive to mental health and quality of life that uh, people are used to living and therefore um, the the importance of transportation cannot be um you know diminished really <clears throat> next slide please um if if you were to think about what's the cost of uh, exclusion of persons with disability uh, there's a ilo work paper which estimates the cost which can be as high as 7% of gdp uh, this is basically when workers 
when persons with disabilities are kept out of employment or are underemployed and it's a huge figure right so 7% of gdp is roughly um, 140 billion dollars and uh, to to just kind of you know, give you a perspective it's 28 times of the money that's been allocated towards uh, procuring vaccines by the government which is about 5 billion dollars or 35000 crore rupees and uh, just imagine the magnitude that we are losing in in, in form of uh, economic dividend when we disallow people to uh, function at their fullest and again um, because transportation is such an important part uh, which enables and facilitates this uh, we are really losing out on that in form of lost productivity of uh, persons with disability uh, themselves but also their carers who otherwise could have been engaged in more productive activities and uh, generated uh, value for the economy next slide um and um government also realizes this so you know uh, over a period of time there have been various measures that have been introduced uh, in 2015 for example uh, narendra modi government introduced uh, the accessible india campaign under which um, airports railway stations and public transport was expected to be made accessible by 2019 the target got pushed uh, later to 2020 um and due to various reasons including covid we've not seen much progress on that uh but uh, kind of you know we we do see uh, some work in that direction both on the physical and the digital side next slide we have the government of delhi which introduced 1000 uh, buses fitted with hydraulic ramps uh, which were expected to ease mobility for uh, persons with disability uh, and particularly locomotor disability um next slide we also have a uh, government of goa which introduced wheelchair accessible buses so that it reduces dropouts um um uh, in school going children uh, and while all of these measures are appreciable and uh, you know uh, they they are helping to move the needle in the right direction i think uh, there's a miss over here and that's primarily because these measures don't work in silos um they they're not delivering the full value for the buck next slide please um at uh, ola mobility institute we really take a trip lens a uh, trip chain lens when it comes to uh, transportation and mobility um we believe that the the transport experience is not limited to the period that you step into a vehicle and step out at your at destination it really starts from the planning process wherein uh, you you kind of you know figure out how do you want to get from play, point a to point b which mode of transport do you use when do you leave your um, house or office and um is there any uh, a reason to change uh, a mode of transport so let's say kind of you know change a bus or change uh, trains um in metro or local train um uh, should you take a, a rickshaw an auto how does uh, price uh, figure into these decisions is it a daytime night time all of this to and goes on from there to uh, really kind of you know getting to the boarding spot be it a train station or a, or a bus stop or a rickshaw stand um it it covers the process wherein you get into the vehicle the in transit experience the experience that you have when you de- uh, disembark from the vehicle um uh, it, when it comes to payment and uh, complaint resolution and what have you so it's an entire trip chain and that's what's kind of you know missing when uh, when government has introduced some of these measures because while for example there is a wheelchair accessible bus um the information around that may not be available as easily to people who need it or for that matter the approach path from one's house to the bus depot uh, may not be available or uh, in your other other factors might be at play over here right so we really need to take a trip chain lens um, and ensure that transportation uh, is safe accessible reliable and affordable from end to end next next slide please so uh when you uh, let's let's take a few examples when it comes to um accessibility across uh, the trip chain take take example of uh, information availability uh when it comes to transportation you have various offline and online modes um offline you may have uh, bus schedules or uh, or train schedules displayed on a board in form of a map or a or a route or in form of a um, uh, kind of you know uh list uh you have various on, online um uh, tools like websites apps uh information and communication systems um uh, but very often they are lacking um because they they may not deliver on 
perhaps one of the factors. It, it may not have timely and relevant information. Um, and this is the, all the more evident in times of COVID. So for example, um, every once in a while, uh, one of our chief uh, ministers or, or, or other government officials come and uh, make a detailed presentation and um, um, explain how they have they are deciding to impose certain restrictions around movement of people, around transportation. But um, I, for example, I'm in Maharashtra and I have not seen uh, these presentations being accompanied by sign language videos, uh, which alienates a large uh, section of the population uh, from the deaf and hard of hearing community. Uh, later, when a detailed notification is released, uh, it's not released in a format that's accessible using screen readers. And so again, you're uh, not informing um, uh, people who live with visual disability or who may be relying on other assistive technology to um, access that information. And, and this is really catching people off guard because they find themselves unprepared to function in an environment with additional restrictions, which, which are ever changing really. Uh, we've already talked, uh, touched upon accessibility in some form, there also needs to be information that's uh, relevant uh, given your nature of disability. So for example, if uh, my nearest metro train is um, is having restrictions around the entry paths, um, I need to know if the uh, entry path that I take, which has a ramp um, as, a, as a wheelchair user is gonna be closed down or is gonna be open. If there's gonna be any other restriction that I'll have to uh, figure out. So some of this information is really missing. And that breaks down the process for um, uh, for transportation when it comes to an independent uh, travel experience. Next slide, please. Sorry, uh, can you go back? One more. Uh, sorry. Okay, my screen actually froze. I think we uh, next slide. Yeah, next one. Perfect. And. <clears throat> When, it, when we talk of the next phase, which is getting to the boarding spot, we all have experienced how our footpaths and roads are in a state of disrepair. Uh, they are not accessible, uh, whether you are a person living with locomotor disability, visual disability, or a non-disabled person. Um, and uh, you know, that's, that's really destructive <clears throat> for an experience. This becomes all the more relevant in today's time when people are expected to maintain social distancing. Um, when one has to negotiate through crowd, uh, trying to avoid contact, trying to avoid getting exposed or avoid exposure if you are a asymptomatic carrier, uh, it's really difficult to manage that. Um, earlier, when, uh, when accessibility of physical environment broke down, uh, you often had people who were, um, who were willing to assist you. But now, given the fear around COVID uh, viruses, you, you have people um, kind of, you know, not coming up to help as much as before, um, which which kind of you know flies in the face of independent living in the first place, but also um, kind of you know destroys confidence of of those uh, who set out to travel to work or otherwise. Um, we also have you know, family members who are equally concerned, and it, it reduces confidence level of those people. And so th this is really an experience that we'd like to avoid uh, uh, for all all the users, whether uh, you live with a disability or not. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, you know, whether COVID or otherwise, you also have um, another nuisance, which is stray animals. Um, you have dogs and bulls, uh, which often kind of attack persons with disability. Um, so I, I, for example, live with a visual disability myself, and I have many friends in the community. And I have firsthand seen how dogs get threatened when they see a white cane, because, uh, you know, certainly a cane does not have a have a pleasant uh, association in their brains and uh, they bark, they attack. During COVID times, this has become all the more problematic because street dogs, which, which earlier su survived on kind of, you know, uh, food being uh, thrown away at them or, or fed to them by bystanders or uh, uh, kind of, you know, from garbage uh, that gets collected outside the shops or restaurants, et cetera, they, they are not finding food and they're getting all the more aggressive. So even when kind of, you, know, you have the best of the uh, facilities available, these small um, aspects, which, uh, which may not appear significant by itself, um, is an accident waiting to happen. And you've seen, kind of, you know, even before COVID, you have exp uh, examples published in the news media, wherein a bull, for example, has attacked a person with disability. There's been other um, challenges. Um, we, we've had kind of, you know, students in, in very reputed universities um, 
face these constraints and um, again like you know this is this really makes it a very inaccessible experience unsafe experience for one to even walk up to the boarding spot next slide please uh and the reason all of this is important because you know it it affects the more choice preferences that you might have um and even though for example you have an accessible metro station or uh, a cab that you can uh, uh hail from the street or a bus uh, these these experiences may um may kind of you know, force you to choose modes that you otherwise wouldn't have chosen for uh, for want of affordability or price points or for that matter you might uh, recruit help of friends and family members or hire a driver which is uh, an expensive affair enough itself but also um you know um as i mentioned flight in the face of independent living and you really don't want to do that especially in times of today when everyone is overworked trying to handle multiple uh, domestic and uh, and professional responsibilities uh, people may be unwell they might not be they, they whether covid or otherwise there's kind of a lot of pressure and you want to avoid that so you you really need um, an infrastructure that's supportive of independent living and uh which is safe accessible reliable um which promotes affordability next slide please even when you get at the boarding spot uh the trouble is many of the vehicles are inaccessible so when it comes to en uh, entrances of um of let's say train stay train uh you can see from examples over here displayed on the screen how the train is at a level uh, much higher than the platform and so as a wheelchair user you may not be able to climb it uh 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 the train uh, similarly for bus you have uh, instances wherein there is no ramp even when there is a ramp people are not um able to uh, operate it because of uh, because either the the staff is not aware how to how to use it or because it's been unused for such a long time that uh it's not well maintained uh and uh, you know like these problems are very common uh there are also changes in uh by schedules these days which uh which in in absence of accessible information um kind of you know uh, throws planning in the toss um for for many this is a problem but especially for people who live with intellectual disability because for many of them they have trained themselves to operate um uh, along a standard operating procedure really and when when there's a change in the bus schedule when the the bus that they're not used to comes in uh when when the conductor is unfamiliar to them uh they really get confused and it affects their productivity and uh, ability to participate in experiences and uh, uh and that's that's kind of you know that's that's a uh, challenge really next slide please uh for for many uh people uh when we interview them we realize that you know the the denial of transportation can be very very stark so um when we interviewed uh, some women from the national association of blind uh, they explained how the buses won't even stop for them uh when when it's just for, uh, the disabled women the blind women uh, waiting for it and uh, you know there's there's a lot of attribution over here one is that as as most of you would know that uh, persons with disability are entitled to travel uh, free of cost on uh, uh, in a bus when they procure a pass and pay an annual fee um and that that kind of you know affects the ticket sales uh, which puts pressure on the conductors and the drivers and so they they rather have someone who's going to buy a ticket than um, ferry someone who's living with a disability and uh, risk losing one passenger right there's also stigma associated with it which uh is all the more magnified because for many people uh disability and disease um have a mental association and that's um that kind of you know um denies the opportunity to even travel next slide please when you speak of the in transit phase so you know this is the time that you have entered the vehicle you are traveling and it's it's going from point a to point b there are variety of challenges that may come about Uh, which range from attitudinal barriers lead uh, as a result of lack of training and sensitization on the parts of drivers conductors and uh, co passengers um you you have instances of harassment wherein under the guise of, of being helpful you have uh, you know disabled women being 
uh, groped and uh, uh, and kind of you know uh, physically harassed. Um, uh, for for persons with disability and women in particular, this is all the uh, all a bigger issue because you know if you were to think about a non-disabled person, this is not a pleasant experience or, a, or a, forget pleasant like acceptable experience even for them. But for uh, for let's say a non-disabled woman, uh, without without trying to dismiss the severity of situation, uh, she um, has an option of let's say exiting the vehicle. Uh, uh, midway, or for that matter, jumping off if the situation becomes that extreme. Uh, for a person with disability and women um, um, in particular, you really don't have that uh, option because imagine if, let's say, you are living with a locomotor disability, how will you escape that situation? Where will you go? If you are some, someone who's living with blindness, probably you may be able to jump off, but now in which direction do you escape and how do you manage uh, to get away from your assailant? And that's a real threat, uh, which kind of, you know, um, um, takes away from the safety aspect of uh, a mode of transport, uh, really. The constant changes also um, disrupt the, the, uh, the, the travel experience for persons with disability, those with intellectual disability, for example, as I mentioned earlier, but also other disabilities because, uh, you know, you, you, you've uh, memorized the route information, you've uh, you're relying on your other senses and so let's say when there is a rerouting uh, that happens uh, on account of uh, road construction or on account of any other reason it's really disorienting for people uh, earlier uh, when covid was uh, not a reality that we lived with there was a chance that you could ask a co-passenger and uh, take assistance from them these days that's not an option that's very often available to you um, either because you don't want to uh, get exposed or because uh, the other people um, are afraid to come forth and help you. And that's, again, kind of, you know, taking away from the travel experience and the independence, really. Next slide, please. Um, I'm going to skip disembarking because um, the experiences are very similar to boarding and also um, the the experiences that speak, that uh, come about when you dis exit the vehicle and uh, maybe like trans go towards your destination, ultimate destination. I want to speak about payments right now. Uh, for a long time, uh, digital payments have received a lot of emphasis, which is which is good in a way because you know uh, you have the opportunity to make these transactions accessible. Um, cash has received uh, less and less uh, kind of you know. Uh, uh, I guess like a preference, the, the preference for digital has increased uh, in the COVID times. The trouble uh, arises when, you know, design choices make uh, these instruments inaccessible. So over here, uh, you you would have um, a photograph of a, um, a credit card machine, uh, a POS terminal, point of sales terminal, which is a touchscreen instrument. And when I, as um, a visually challenged person, wants to enter my PIN, I'm not able to do that. Um, and this is a this is a true story, for example, on my part that when we when I'd gone to purchase some consumer durables and the amount was significant, um, the the POS terminal was a touch screen, so um, I was not confident if the the amount keyed in was correct. Um, am I gonna kind of you know be overcharged by any chance? Um, and uh, that that destroys the experience. Similarly, when it comes to vending machines or uh, kiosks for tickets for a for a uh, you know like contactless experience really or, or experience that that's separate from human interaction uh, many of the times these um, these experiences are these uh, interactions are not accessible and that again kind of you know disables you because you're not able to buy a ticket to uh, for, for your journey um, as also many of the mobile apps that are used for payments um, um, may, may not be accessible either fully or partially um, very often, when these apps are updated um, uh, from time to time, there is something um, that breaks in in terms of accessibility, and you have to, uh, you know, you you walked out of the house relying on the on the assumption that um, the app that was useful yesterday, the payment experience that was accessible yesterday, is not accessible anymore, and that's something that kind of you know lands you lands you up in trouble. Um, so you have you have a lot of scope for improvement when it comes to payment, and there's a lot of opportunity over here to make experiences accessible and affordable. <clears throat> Next slide, please. Yeah. So um, I'd like to <clears throat> you know like close by speaking about some uh, recommendations for this uh, when it comes to this. Um, 
to begin with, I think we there's an urgent need for uh, information, data points that are disaggregated by gender, age, and disability. Uh, unless we have that information that's timely, that's reliable, that's accurate, um, effective transport planning may not be possible. Um, so we, we need information, not just about population, but we also need information on uh, uh, travel uh, data for persons with disability, obviously in an anonymized, disaggregated way, which does not intrude on someone's privacy. Uh, but this information is important because then policymakers uh, would be forced to take notice and put in measures that are accessible. Uh, right now, we are a really uh, invisible population in some ways, and uh, uh, kind of you know that that keeps us from having access experiences that are safe, accessible, reliable, and affordable. Uh, the next one is uh, we need standards for accessible transport, which would provide guidance to the operators uh, in terms of creation of experience and also establish baseline on as to which uh, what elements of transportation will make um, things accessible for persons with disability. Um, right now, in absence of that, you you may not even even well intentioned. Uh, um, what do you call? It? Operators might be at loss to where as to where to start, right? So that's that's an important um, element that's kind of you know missing. We would want uh, SARA, which is safety, accessibility, reliability, and affordability, to be a core tenant and a mandatory condition for awarding government contracts. Uh, government in spending has uh, goals beyond returns uh, on investment. They have development goals, and um, as a as a large buyer with significant spending. Uh, it has um, the power to use public policy to influence um, uh, you know, market dynamics. So if this was an essential condition for government contracts, we would have um, um, kind of you know, effects on the supply side wherein people would be incentivized to create safe, accessible, affordable, um, reliable experiences when it comes to transportation, infrastructure, vehicles, uh, operations, and what have you. So that's that's something that's uh, very important. Um, we we've, we've spoken uh, a little bit about the the uh, you know travel subsidy that persons with disability get, for example, in the bus systems, and what are the unwanted side effects of those. Um, you also have uh, governments kind of you know, announce subsidies for or kind of you know, free travel for women from time to time or any other measures. We really have an opportunity over here to use the digital infrastructure that's created, the India stack that's in place to, um, to mobilize these subsidies uh, in a digital way, uh, which, will, which will help in um, kind of you know, record keeping, which will help in data creation uh, that will be then useful for planning purposes, but also which will uh, disincentivize people from, for example, denying service to uh, persons with disability and other marginalized communities. Um, Lastly, um, we need we need a supply side intervention as well from the from the government. And over here, uh, we would want uh, the government to announce certain incentives, which would which, which would kind of you know push the uh, uh, supply side, which are transport operators, automobile manufacturers, and um, other players, to create experiences that are uh, that accessible. Um, right now, right now that uh, the, the trouble that kind of you know often occurs. Uh, uh, through our conversations with uh, business owners is that they they try and make a decision on a cost and return basis, right? uh, the return on investment basis. And uh, in absence of credible data, in absence of information around purchasing power, in absence about market size, uh, they, they, they are less um, inclined to take decisions that are, that, that which they agree are right, but they're not prioritizing that. And so incentives on that front would help kickstart the process, which uh, which we've seen help happen in other places. For example, when uh, the government wanted to incentivize digital payments, it capped the uh, the merchant discount rate or the fees that credit card um, uh, accepting um, merchants are taking um, are paying for that matter uh, to incentivize its its adoption. And so we need some some incentives like that, which may range from uh, tax breaks or any other kind of incentives. Um, and so. That's that's another recommendation that uh, we have for the for the policymakers and market participants. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so 
that's that's all that uh, we have for you over here. Um, and also before before kind of you know, we open up for Q and A, um, I'd like to share some information about an upcoming report from the Oda Mobility Institute, which goes much more in depth along the the lines that we spoke about. We have partnered with over nine um, organizations working for the empowerment of persons with disability with a collective um, experience of more than 175 years. Uh, we have engaged in uh, uh, semi-structured interviews and focus group discussions with persons with disabilities across uh, three, uh, three groups, namely persons living with locomotor disability, persons living with visual disability, and members of deaf and hard of hearing community to understand their travel experiences uh, across uh, various modes of transport, including metros and local trains, uh, along buses and uh, auto rickshaws and uh, uh, taxis. Uh, whether you hail it um, offline uh, in, uh, or you hail it through a mobile aggregator. Um, and uh, it has some really uh, interesting insights. I'm sure that will be useful for uh, policymakers, businesses, and also um, accessibility champions such as yourself. So um, I request you to keep an eye on that. If you are interested uh, in getting a copy, I request you to put your uh, contact information in the chat box and uh, we, we try and kind of you know, uh, ensure that uh, a copy is sent to you directly uh, upon its release uh, shortly. Um, and yeah, we um, so we, we're really excited about that. With that, I'd like to thank, uh, thank you folks and uh, welcome any questions which you may have.